old Battersea House was built in what was then the country outside London, sometime between 1669 and 1699, very likely designed by Christopher Wren came into the ownership in 1971 of the great American publisher, Malcolm Forbes. He and his son, Christopher, started here at this house, the most important collection of Victorian art formed in the second half of the 20th century. This is a unique opportunity to explore and acquire a part of the Forbes collection, which is a testament to the scholarship of its creator, Christopher Kip Forbes, and which displays his encyclopedic knowledge of the British royal family and Victorian art and antiques. The collection is housed in a magnificent manor house, Old Battersea House, which was painstakingly and lovingly restored to its former glory and turned into an intimate family home, first by Malcolm Forbes and then by his son, Kip. Join me as we journey through its elegant rooms and discover just some of the treasures that will be in the upcoming sale by Lyon and Turnbull in Edinburgh on Tuesday, November 1st. Behind me is one of the masterpieces of Victorian art, in my opinion. This is The Penny Bank by Sir George Harvey. Harvey was determined to produce images of the working poor that gave them dignity. The artist, George Harvey, was a leader in Edinburgh and helped to found the Royal Scottish Academy, which was the equivalent of the Royal Academy in London in Scotland, and together made Scotland, with a number of other artists of the period, a major source and center of Victorian art. This 1866 masterpiece by Burne Jones, Princess Chained to a Tree, is truly one of the stars of the collection, particularly because it relates so perfectly to England and to St. George. What this is telling us is the story of the Libyan princess being chained to a tree because her village was ravaged by a dragon. And every day, the young women would be drawing from the lottery and they would be fed to the dragon. And one day, the king's daughter, her lot was drawn. As it happens, George, a Roman soldier who had converted to Christianity, was riding by, saw this poor woman, went and saved her, killed the dragon, the entire town converted to Christianity, and everyone was a hero. His sword had a name, and it was Ascalon. Churchill's private plane during World War II was called Ascalon as a perfect remembrance to what England and St. George mean. Behind me is one of the stars of the collection, this great melee called For the Squire, where this sweet young image of Victorian girlhood is handing to the unseen squire an envelope addressed to him. This painting has a clear sentimentality that makes it Victorian and is all the better for it. This Rosetti, formerly called Regina Cordium, a portrait of Mrs. Adam Heaton, is one of the signature pieces of the collection. Everything about this speaks of love. And on top of that, you have this wonderful frame that the man himself, Rosetti, designed in his famous thumbprint pattern. This was one of his trademarks. It's unusual for any painting to have its original frame around it. What makes this even more valuable is it only has that, but it also has his, his paneling. Instead of a normal mat, this is a wood paneling in the inside. This is a wonderful tribute to a man's love for his wife, done by one of the founders of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood.
This iconic photograph of Queen Victoria with her gilly, John Brown, is famous to us today. It was just as famous in Victorian times. To my left down here is a painting by Barber, a Norfolk artist who specialized in scenes of children with their pets. He took and almost did an exact replica of this photograph in this painting, which also in of itself is famous. Today in the Royal Collection, there are a number of pieces by Barber. Next to it is another amazing piece, also iconic. Astonishing, we have these two pieces side by side that have been reproduced all over the world in textbooks and in books on art. This is Theodore Blake Orgman, Peace with Honor, which is Queen Victoria with Prime Minister Disraeli, talking about the peace that has just been signed from the Treaty of Berlin. Both wonderful pieces, each depicting Queen Victoria's relationship with two very different but equally important men in her life. Both Malcolm and Christopher Forbes took a great deal of inspiration from Queen Victoria in forming the Forbes Old Battersea House collection. And this wonderful and iconic painting, for me, is a quintessential piece in this intensely personal collection. What we see here by Frank Hall is a young mother, very likely, even possibly out of wedlock, a baby that's very sick in a chemist shop waiting for something that may or may not save her baby's life. Hall himself was determined to reach fame and fortune. He exhausted himself and died at the age of 40 for overwork and left us, among many legacies, this fantastic masterpiece. We're here in the upper hallway where I want to share with you three wonderful bronzes. What we see here is a great bust of Edward VII. Edward is designed by the sculptor Sidney March in 1901, the year that he came to the throne. And what we have as a complement to that over here are his parents, Victoria and Albert, also cast by Elkington, but this time the sculptor was William Theed. This whole wonderful Victorian set piece um, a dynasty of the Saxe Coburg Gotha family, all put together, perfectly displayed in this celebration of everything Victorian at Old Battersea House. What's wonderful about this room is who slept in this bed. This was Elizabeth Taylor's room when she came to the Battersea House, which happened a number of times. She was a very good friend of all the Forbes family. She loved it here. This house and bed gave her a lot of peace and tranquility, as it will to anyone who owns it. One of the things that the Forbes have, in addition to a great art collection, is a wonderful collection of memorabilia. 
what I have behind me here stuck into this little corner of the wall is a ticket to Queen Victoria's coronation procession. And this guy actually had row five, seat 20. is written here on the side. And there's a wax seal of some official up here at the top. This kind of ephemera um, doesn't have a high intrinsic value, but it's a wonderful snapshot into the past so we can see what was going on, what it was like in Victorian times to have a ticket. This painting up here by Sir George Hayter of the coronation of George IV. This is clearly not Westminster Abbey. This is Westminster Hall, where the great banquet for the king was held. This was a tremendous affair because George was estranged from his wife, Queen Caroline. He didn't even want her to have the title of queen. He barred her from attending all the ceremonies of his coronation. And in spite of the enormous cost involved in this, the common people enjoyed this very much. And there was a great celebration all throughout London during this time. Everything about George was big, and what I have here is this medallion portrait done of him in 1808 when he was still Prince of Wales. What's interesting about this is that there were only 18 of these made, and this was made to celebrate the laying of the cornerstone of the Covent Garden Theatre, what we today call the Royal Opera House in London. And even though there was a subsequent fire that destroyed this opera house, probably somewhere in a cornerstone somewhere, this medallion exists. Queen Victoria was herself a skilled watercolorist. She passed on this talent to her eldest child, Princess Victoria, who would later give birth to Kaiser Wilhelm II, the last Kaiser of Germany. This watercolor in gouache has some wonderful detail. The princess was quite clearly accomplished, and I'm surprised this piece was allowed to leave the royal collection. It's just one of the many pieces painted by a royal hand available in the upcoming sale. I said to you earlier that the Forbeses love collecting royal memorabilia, and I'm not sure if you realize just how far they've taken that. To my right here, it's Queen Victoria's nightgown and two pairs of her stockings. If you follow me over here, you can see two more mementos of the Queen, but the best thing is this. We have the Queen's knickers, and these have a teeny tiny VR and a crown up here on them. What I find most interesting about this is talking to a historian who said to me that these garments, after the death of a monarch, all would have been destroyed. The fact that these survive is very likely that somebody, most likely a servant, would have secreted them out of the palace, probably wearing them themselves, and sold them for a pretty penny. And that's probably what's going to happen again. The Forbes Old Battersea House collection will be sold at auction by Lyne and Turnbull at 33 Broughton Place, Edinburgh, Scotland, on Tuesday, November 1st, 2011, at 11 a.m. The collection can be viewed in London at Old Battersea House by appointment on Friday, October 14th, with open viewing on Saturday and Sunday, the 15th and 16th of October, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Or in Edinburgh, on October 28th, 29th, 30th, and 31st, and from 9 a.m. on the morning of the sale. The catalog for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity is available online at lineandturnbull.com and is also available on this DVD. Just pop the DVD into your computer and navigate to the folder marked Catalog.